welcome to lecture 1b in this lecture our focus is on to have a deeper understanding about instruction set architecture and addressing modes in the last lecture video we had a quick recap on basic computer organization principles right from the important registers that are there in the processor today we will have a quick recap of those followed by learning about what is instruction set architecture we have seen this in yesterday's uh, discussion that the execution cycle of a program consists of instruction fetch decode open and fetch execute storing the result and then moving on to the next instruction and we have seen that there are few important registers like mar mdr ir program counter accumulator this all works together along with the control unit to get task done in the arithmetic logic unit and overall this is been controlled by a system clock now let us try to see what we have seen yesterday in our fetch and decode operation during the fetching operation we know that from the program counter the value will go to mar and then it will goes to the ram and from there the instruction will reach mdr and from mdr it will goes to the ir and now the decoding happens in ir with the help of the control unit and necessary control signals are been generated so this is what we learned already and how various registers like program counter mar mdr and ir are working together to make sure that the fetching decoding and uh, the execution of instruction is been carried out in a smooth manner now von neumann model is one of the popular architecture that we see and we know that it consists of programs which are inside your memory so the memory which has the programs that are been stored and from the memory we are going to fetch the instructions and later the decoding that we already know and we see that the memory address register and memory data register are acting as the interface now let us try to understand in this video more about an instruction and what do you mean by an instruction set architecture as you all know instruction is the most basic unit of command if you want the computer to perform a task the fundamental task is an instruction whose execution is what we have seen with the help of various registers special registers inside your microprocessor so instructions are typically words in the language of a computer and instruction set architecture is the vocabulary that is been used so like what you told if you wanted to communicate some task to a computer it has to be represented as an instruction and typically these instructions are made up of some standard rules so the vocabulary is been defined by instruction set architecture upon which we will have a detailed discussion today so the language of a computer can be written in three ways one is it can be machine language which only computer can read the second one is a high level language which is in a human readable representation which a computer cannot read and something is in between which is the assembly language which also typically human readable representation and we use translators such that whether it is a high level language or an assembly language statement it has to be converted to an equivalent machine language statement such that it is readable by a computer now we have already seen that instructions and data are already stored in memory so typically instruction length is known as word length so in some microprocessors all instructions are of uniform length and in some others the instructions are of variable length so the processor fetches the instruction from the memory sequentially that's generally what it happens you fetch the instruction and decode and then you execute the instruction and later you go to the next instruction so this is the typical sequence that happens the address of the next instruction is stored in the program counter so depending upon what is the length of the current instruction the program counter is incremented so if the length of the current instruction is 4 byte then my pc is updated as pc equal to pc plus 4 so in short we have to understand that when you fetch an instruction the program counter has to be pointing to the next instruction so how do you do the incrementing 
that is depending on how big the current instruction is. If the current instruction is 8 byte, then PC equal to PC plus 8. If it is 4 byte, PC equal to PC plus 4. If it is a single byte instruction, then accordingly we have to move. So, PC incrementer is an additional circuit that is being connected to PC, which will update the PC value depending upon the length of the current instruction that is going to be fetched. Now, we have seen that instruction is the basic unit of command, but there are different types of instruction depending on the requirement. Sometimes you may have to perform certain tasks in arithmetic logic unit. Sometimes prior to doing such a kind of a task, we need to bring the corresponding data into appropriate register. So, there can be some kind of a data movement that happens across memory hierarchy, let us say from, from your memory into the registers and registers into memory and movement across registers, across memory. So, some kind of a data movement required and sometimes you may have to perform some checking which will determine in what way the program flow should be moving on, whether it should go in a straight line sequence or should I jump into another line or not. So, here we are going to have a broader classification of instructions, but they may of course vary from one microprocessor to another. But looking from a computer architecture perspective, we can categorize them into three. The first one is arithmetic and logic instructions. The second one is data movement instructions and the third one is control flow instructions. Let us take one by one and try to understand what are the category of instructions that are belonging to each of the set. So, first one arithmetic and logic instruction, these are instructions which are typically executed in your arithmetic logic unit. So, for example, if there is any integer arithmetic operation or logical operations like comparison of two quantities, shifting and rotating the bits inside a register, testing and comparing, all these are examples of arithmetic and logic instruction. So, anything related to an integer arithmetic like add, subtract, multiply, logical operations like AND, OR, comparison, shifting, rotating, all belong to task or operations which are essentially carried out inside your ALU. So, the operands has to come into the ALU and then ALU perform the task and then generate the result. They are basically classified as arithmetic and logical instructions. Moving into the second one, they are known as data movement instructions. So, this is data is been moved between memory hierarchy. So, we know that inside the processor you have registers and then you have memory. So, it can be between registers. There are some microprocessors which support movement between two memory locations and sometimes data movement can be from memory to register and sometimes it can be from register to memory. So, moving data from memory to CPU registers typically known as load operations, moving data from CPU registers to memory known as store operations, these are movement between registers and memory like what is being told like this and then you have to move the data between the memory to memory and between registers as well. And the last category is moving data from input output devices to the registers inside. So, all these belonging to data movement instruction because the focus is basically on moving your data from one memory hierarchy into another. Now, the third category is known as control flow instructions. In this case, whenever you need to perform certain checking and upon the outcome of such a check, either the instruction that has to be executed is A, else it has to be B. So, this basically will alter the flow of the execution. They also belonging to control flow. So, there are certain specific instructions which will initiate the program or starting of a program, halting of the program and sometimes you may need to skip to other instructions. Sometimes testing data to decide whether to skip over some instruction, basically your jump instruction and jumping can be based upon some carry flag sometimes zero flag, some type of flag that is been there. So, some conditional checking that is being done. So, they all belonging to the control flow instructions. Now, depending upon the microprocessor that you use, we can further subdivide this kind of broader category that we have learned into finer kind of classification. But at this point, we would restrict our discussion to arithmetic logic instructions, those which are carried out inside ILU, data movement instructions which will take care of movement of data between or inside a memory hierarchy and the last one is 
program control instructions which will take care of essentially the sequencing of the instructions. Now let us consider the example of add instruction. So consider a high level language instruction where you specify a equal to b plus c. So the content of b and c has to be added and then has to be stored in a. So the programmer need not know how it is being carried out, whether it is carried out inside a so register or what are the category of instruction that is being used. So programmer specify a very high level language code. He need not be expert in computer architecture. In assembly language code, this is being converted into add a comma b comma c, where b and c are the source operands, a is the destination operand add is the mnemonic that represents the operation that indicates it is an add operation. So essentially content of B and C has to be added and it has to be stored in the register or in the location A. Now this much if what is happening the initial portion is from the programmer perspective and then the assembly language which is equivalent to that and its meaningful representation. Now let us come to hardware. In this hardware imagine that these variables are being assigned to some register. So it is being decided for example, R0 is a register inside your microprocessor wherein the value of A is supposed to be stored. Similarly, R1 stores B and R2 stores C. So if this is known as variable to register mapping. Once that mapping is done, now think of a case your microprocessor will support an add instruction and if there is a restriction that add can be performed only on two registers, so the source operand I have to specify like this. So the syntax tells that the first operand has to be the destination, the other two has to be the source. So I specify in order to carry out this task A, B, C, I have to specify B and C as the second and third operand. Since it is already mentioned B is R1, so B comes here, C is R2 and A is going to be R0. So this is the way how it is being done. So if the assembly language specifies add R0, R1 and R2. Now when you translate it, this represents R1. This is the machine language form completely binary. This represents for example add and now this represents R0. Imagine there are 16 registers ranging from R0 to R15 wherein we require 4 bits to uniquely identify one of the registers. So this indicate R0 then R1 and this is R2. So this is completely your machine level language and there exists a translator which will specify the corresponding assembly level code into the machine language code. Now let us try to understand what is instruction set architecture and what is micro architecture. So instruction set architecture is something that is agreed upon or it is the interface that is agreed upon between the software and the hardware. So the hardware has to tell if you wanted to communicate with me, you use these kind of instructions. So hardware one will tell these are my set of instructions which I can understand. So if you want me to do some task, specify using these instructions. This is my set of instructions. Similarly, another hardware B, it may have its own set of instruction sets. Now let us see where this will fit into. So you have a program or an application and then we have the instruction set architecture that sits in between. So whatever is the program, the instruction set architecture has to make use of the underlying micro architecture and the circuits. So this will interact with the micro architecture that we have seen. So the software or the compiler assumes certain things based upon its understanding on the hardware and the hardware promises that if you communicate to me in this way, then I will deliver the result. So the software writer needs to know the ISA in order to write and debug system or user programs. This is the basic understanding. So it is an architectural feature. Now what does micro architecture tells? It specifies implementation of an ISA. It is not visible to the software and what your microprocessor means? It consists of an instruction set architecture the micro architectural features and the circuits that implement this micro architectural features. This is your typical architectural feature of your microprocessor. So in short, ISA is the interface which need to be known to the users and the micro architecture is the implementation of that particular ISA. As we already mentioned, ISA, the instruction set architecture is the interface and the micro architecture is the implementation of that. 
Let us try to see with the help of an example. Consider the case that you are driving a car and then you have the accelerator pedal. So, if you press on it, you know that this is the interface by which the driver, if he wishes to increase the speed, has to press on it. The result of which is the acceleration happens in the engine. But the internals of the engine is not known. So, the implementation of this pressing on the pedal is actually happening inside the engine. So, the engine deals with the implementation whereas, the pedal is the interface. Similarly, when you come to for example, an add instruction, whether a microprocessor has uh, will support an add instruction or not, that is the interface. So, it will tell I support an add instruction. If you wanted to do two adding of two numbers, use this instruction and this is the format, the instruction set architecture. But how I do it? I can do a ripple carry addition. I can do a carry lookahead addition. There are different kind of adding circuits that is been available. That is an implementational feature. So, to have whether an add instruction is there or not, it is the instruction set architecture portion. And how once if you have an add operation, how do you carry out? Whether you carry out using a ripple carry addition or a carry lookahead addition, then that is an implementational feature. That is a micro architectural feature. So, I hope with this example of what we told in the respect to a car acceleration, where the pedaling is the interface and the engine is the implementation. In the case of an adder, the instruction, whether an instruction is there or not, that is the interface that is ISA and how do you carry out that is a micro architectural feature. Now, we know that an instruction consists of opcode and operand. In majority of the cases, you have opcode and operand, but rarely there are some cases wherein only opcode is there. Now, we are going to classify the instruction set architecture. This instruction set architecture can be of stack architecture, accumulator architecture, register memory architecture and register, register or load store architecture. So, various uh, possible four ways are there in which you are going to carry this out. So, let us try to understand what is the difference between these type of classifications. Now, look at this diagram. We have the first one which is known as a stack architecture, where you can see that there exists an ALU. We have a memory and we have a processor. Inside processor, we have an ALU which is connected to a stack. So, any operation that you do, you will take the top two elements, they will be the operands and the result will be stored top, back to the top. So, in order to carry out any task using a stack architecture or using a stack instruction set architecture, then First, we have to make sure that the operands are kept inside the stack, in the top of the stack. So, whenever you wanted to perform any operation, where there are two operands, you pop off the two elements from the top of the stack, they are fed to the input of the ALUs and accordingly, the output will be generated and the output is stored back in the stack. So, consider the case if you wanted to perform C equal to A plus B. So, first you have to push the value of A that will go to stack, push the value of B that will also go to stack. Now, B is in top of the stack and A is just beneath. When you perform an add operation, two elements from the top of the stack is being popped off. So, B and A will reach the input of ALU, perform the add, the result what you get that is pushed. So, these are the set of instructions that are used to realize C equal to A plus B in a stack architecture. Now, consider the accumulator architecture. Here also, we can see that there is an ALU inside your processor. Rather than a stack, the ALU is connected to a specific register, which is known as your accumulator. Now, we can see from the diagram, one of the input of your ALU is directly fed from accumulator. That means, when you perform an arithmetic logic operation, one of the data has to come from the accumulator. The second operand has to come from memory and the result will be always stored in accumulator. This is the way how it works. Now, see you have to load the value A. So, load A means I am loading into the accumulator. Now, when I specify add, in this case I have to specify only the memory operand because the other operand is implied, it will be coming directly from the accumulator. So, when you perform add B, whatever was there in accumulator, the A is coming and the B is the new operand that I specify, A plus B will be done and then I have to perform store of C. So, whatever is the value that has been there, that will be available in the accumulator by default. 
So, from the accumulator, the value has to be pushed back into C, where C may be your memory location. Now, we move into register memory architecture. The only difference between the accumulator architecture and register memory architecture is, here we have a set of registers. And we can load these registers then implicitly by specifying what is the destination register. Whereas, in this case of load, I need not specify what is the destination, because there is only one register that is accumulator. Here, since we have multiple registers, we have to mention what is the register that we are targeting on. And then, for any ALU operation, one of the input can be from any registers, second input can be from memory and the result automatically will be placed in some of the registers. So, now let us see load R1, comma A. So, R1 is one of the registers and then the value in A is being transferred to R1. Now, I am specifying add R3, R1, B. So, R1 which contains your A, B is a direct operand that is been coming from memory and the result is stored in R3 because I cannot store the result directly into the memory. It will be always going into one of the registers that is been shown like this. Now, from there explicitly I have to move the result from R3 into C. So, that is called the register memory architecture. Now, the last category is known as the register register architecture. It is also known as load store architecture. Here the peculiarity is ALU where both inputs has to be there from registers. I cannot take an operand from the memory. So, if the data value is already available in memory, prior to that we have to explicitly move them to appropriate registers and in an arithmetic logic operation all the operands, the destination operand and the source operands all are part of the register file only. So, now can you see this load R1, comma A, the first one, the first operand is moved to R1, second operand is moved to R2. So, now your R1 and R2 holds your two operands and then explicitly specify add R3, R1, R2. So, content of R1 and R2 are added and the result is getting stored in R3. Since we want the result back in C, we perform a store operation which will transfer the value that is available in R3 into C. So, this is the way how the four architectures work. So, to summarize, we have learned about what a stack architecture is. There is only a stack that has been there and the ALU is connected to stack. You have to transfer the operands into the stack first and from the top of the stack, the operands are being fetched to ALU. The result is also stored in top of the stack. Now, replacing the stack with an accumulator that is called an accumulator architecture, one operand is coming from accumulator, second operand can be from memory. There can be explicit movement using load and store instructions, wherein contents of memory and contents of accumulator are being exchanged. The third architecture is known as the register memory architecture, in which you can have multiple registers connected. Rather than a single accumulator, you can have multiple registers connected into the ALU. And then one of the operand is taken from these registers and the second operand to the ALU can be from the memory. And the result will be always stored in one of the registers and explicit movement can be done. The last category is known as register register architecture or load store architecture where arithmetic operations can be performed only on operands which are there inside registers. And then we have to use specific load or store instructions in order to move the data from memory into the processor registers and from processor registers into the memory. So, these are the four classifications. We now take an example and then try to see what is the code that is being generated in various architectures. First of all, let us consider a stack machine architecture. So, the statement that we wanted to generate code is A equal to D star B plus C minus E. It is a high level language statement. Now, what is the set of instruction that is generated if the underlying hardware is a stack machine? So, we know that we have to perform B and C first and then multiply with D. So, first we push the value of D. So, D go into your stack, then you push B and push C. So, now B and C will reach the top of the stack, perform an add operation. So, this will make sure B plus C is being done and that is going to the top and then you perform a multiplication operation. So, with this D also is being multiplied and then we have to push the value of E and then perform a subtraction operation and then the pop the value into A. So, ultimately you get A equal to D into B plus C minus E. We can see that 
there are push and pop operations where you specify from which memory location you have to push into the stack and from the stack to which memory location we have to pop out that is exactly what you see in push and pop and when you specify arithmetic operations like add multiplication or subtraction the operands are not there they are implied they will be taken from the top of the stack and the result of this arithmetic operation is pushing the result back into top of stack. Now, the same high level language let us try to see in the accumulator machine. So, in the accumulator machine we have first we have to perform a load B. So, the content of B will be going into the accumulator and then you perform add C. So, with this B plus C is done and then you have to perform multiplication of D. So, that will take care of D into B plus C and then what we do is we perform a subtraction on E. So, whatever is the value that is available in the accumulator that minus E that is what you get and then you perform the value in stir. So, now you see if you go for a accumulator architecture we can see the number of instructions are drastically reduced because I can perform operations by this load add multiplication and subtraction and uh, the number of instructions are much less. This also will give you the same result, but depending on underlying architecture and instruction set that it support. Now, let us look into a load store machine where all arithmetic operations has to be supported with only registers as its input. So, load R1 comma D the first one I am loading my value of D into R1 value of B into R2 value of C into R 3. So, now 3 of them are coming into the registers and then R 2 and R 3 that means, you perform B plus C and the value is stored in R 4 and then you perform a multiplication on D, D is already stored in R 1 with B plus C whose resultant is available in R 4. So, at this process we have D star B plus C that is available that will be now available in R 5 and then you load the value of E into R 6 because I cannot directly subtract any data operand that is there it has to move to one of the registers. So, now E is placed in R 6 and then you perform a subtraction on R 5 and R 6. So, E is subtracted from D star B plus E the resultant is available in R 7 now that has to be moved to A. So, store R 7 comma A. So, here you can see that the number of instructions increased and that is the feature of the underlying instruction set architecture. So, we have seen a comparison of the various uh, architectures and a single high level language construct that is been given A equal to D into B plus C minus E the same high level language statement what are the set of instructions that are getting generated in various different architectures for your seen under the stack architecture in the accumulator architecture and then in the load store architecture. We now move into the next topic about addressing modes. We have already learned about categories of instructions, the instruction set architecture. Now, we come to the next concept, a very important concept known as addressing modes. What is addressing mode? Addressing mode is the way in which the operand of an instruction is specified. We know that an instruction consists of opcodes and operands. Now, how do you specify the operand where my data value is? There are different types of addressing modes. We will take one by one with the help of an example. The various kind of addressing modes are implicit addressing mode, immediate addressing mode, direct addressing mode, indirect, register, register indirect, indexed, stack and the last category auto increment and decrement addressing modes. Let us take the first one. It is known as implicit addressing mode. Here the peculiarity is the operand is implied. There is no need to specify the operand. So, the instruction some in this case contains only the opcode. I will not specify what is the operand name. It is understood. It is implied. What does it mean? Let us take an example. Consider the first example where the instruction is CMA. CMA stands for complement accumulator. Whatever is the content of accumulator. So, here you have accumulator value 1010. When I perform CMA operation or complement accumulator operation, it will become 0101. 
complementing of that. But I am not specifying it should be done on accumulator. That is the difference. So, this is called implied. Now, coming to example 2, here shift left and count accumulator. This is an instruction which has only an opcode where the contents of the accumulator has to be shifted towards left. Here also the operand is accumulator, it need not be explicitly specified. So, when we have an instruction where an operand need not be specified, it is implicit, then it is known as an implicit addressing mode. The next in addressing mode what we learned today is immediate addressing mode. Here the operand is part of the instruction. The operand is located in the instruction itself. So, the instruction consists of an opcode and an operand field. Example, add hash 5. The meaning is add 5, the numerical quantity 5 has to be added to the content of accumulator. Think of a case wherein add means always one of the operand is accumulator. The second one is directly specifying that. So, operand is part of the instruction itself, 5 is the operand. So, there is no memory reference required in order to fetch the operand. So, it is fast in this case. I fetch the instruction, one of the operand is always available in the accumulator, the second value is part of the instruction. So, no more fetching of the operand, it is fast. But then the problem here is my operand has to fit into the size. Let us say if this space is only 8 bit, then my operand can be maximum ranging from minus 128 to plus 127 or maximum 255 numbers is what I can use because that is the size that is been given. If the number of bits for the operand is 16 bit, then there also the range is there, the range will be increased. Now, we go to direct addressing mode. In the case of direct addressing mode, rather than specifying the operand part of the instruction, I specify the address of the operand. So, the effective address is already specifies in the instruction. So, add A means add the contents of memory address A to accumulator. So, one of the operand is accumulator, the second operand you can find out and its address is A. So, you have to look into memory, you look for address of A and the content of the location is your operand. So, here a memory reference is required to access the data, but there is no additional calculations, it has been directly specified. So, how much is your memory access that is limited to the address space. Okay. So, one like what is been specified, add is an operation. If you imagine that one of the operand of add is your accumulator, the second operand I have to specify. So, in the previous case, the value was directly coming in the immediate addressing mode. In the direct addressing mode, I will specify the address of your operand. So, here it is A. A is a memory address, go to memory whose address is A and that contains your operand. So, a single memory reference is required, I have to access memory in order to get your data. Now, we move into the next addressing mode which is called indirect. So, direct means spe specifying the location's address. So, indirect means memory cell pointed to by address field contains the address of the operand. So, effective address is called address of A. So, what you do? Look in A and find out what is its contents. That will be indirectly pointing to the operand. So, for example, add within bracket A. So, what is the difference between add A that is a direct addressing mode where A is the address and add content of A means A is an address. You go to the location, you will get a value that value is the address of the operand. So, add contents of the cell pointed to by contents of A to the accumulator. Probably this diagram will give a better picture. On left side what you see is direct addressing and on right side we have indirect addressing. So, if you have an instruction where I specify opcode and address A, with the address A this is your memory, this is the operand directly your effective address is already mentioned in A. Whereas, in the case of an indirect addressing, you are specifying here B. So, this is location B. Location B is pointing to the operand. So, there is one level of indirection. So, the first one you access B, second one 
access content of B where the operand is. So, that, that is the reason why it is called indirect. So, two memory access is required to access the operand in the case of an indirect act addressing whereas, a single access is required in order to perform a direct addressing. So, the representational difference is the effective address is A in this case, effective address is content of B in this case. So, in both the case it is been the address is given here address of only B is given here address of operand is given and the opcode will have few bits which will tell whether the instruction is specified in direct addressing mode or indirect addressing mode. Accordingly, the meaning of the opcode field has to be interpreted. Now, let us come to the register addressing mode. Here operand you can see that rather than a memory location I give the register name. So, operand is held in the register named in the address field. So, effective address equal to R. There are limited number of registers that we have. So, let us say if you have 32 registers then only 5 bits are being required to specify. We cannot increase the number of registers beyond. So, the number of possibilities also is limited. So, very small address field is needed. So, comparatively your instruction would be shorter because number of bits used to represent a register is much less. Faster instructions fetching because there is no memory access that is being required. Once you fetch the instruction it will tell where what is the register number from which I can get the operand. So, directly go. So, no memory access required very fast execution, but the address space is limited. So, opcode here if you tell R 1. So, to the register file you go to R 1 and there lies your operand. So, try to understand the difference between direct addressing mode and register addressing mode. In direct addressing mode the address of the memory location is given. So, you have to go outside your processor go to memory and get it. Whereas, in register addressing mode you are giving the name of the register or the address of the register which is still inside your processor. So, register addressing mode is faster. Now, let us come to the register indirect addressing mode where it is also some kind of an indirection that we have seen already we have seen what is memory indirect addressing mode. So, effective address is uh, basically content of R. So, operand is in memory cell pointed to by the contents of R. So, here we have larger address space because now my operand can be there inside your memory. So, the real operand is in memory, but the memory's address is kept inside your register and the register name is given, but it requires only one memory access than the other one. So, let us see what is the difference in register indirect addressing mode. The name of the register is specified. Let us say I specify R4. So, go to R4, this is the R4 and R4 will give an address and that is now going to memory where lies your operand. So, one register access and one memory access that is what is happening in register indirect addressing mode. Now, displacement addressing mode. So, in displacement addressing mode the address field hold two values one is known as a base value and other one is the register that holds the displacement or it can be vice versa. So, effective address is the base value that you have and the content of the register that is being kept. So, what we can see here is you are specifying the address which is part of the instruction and we are specifying a register name. This register name when you go it will give some value that is added with this displacement and this will give you the effective address. So, this is the effective address that you can see. So, effective address is a register name is given, go to that register, extract its contents that is what you get it here and then whatever is the address portion which is part of the instruction itself that is been extracted out, add them that gives the effective address. So, A plus content of R and that is your operand. So, one register access is there after that there is an adder delay is there and then you access the memory location that is called displacement addressing mode. So, this is typically used if at all you wanted to shift to or jump to any location whose base register value is been given and the displacement is given with respect to an address. Now, we have relative addressing mode this is also a version of displacement addressing what you have seen, but here rather than the register 
you have a program counter. So previously here you can see it can be anything on the register. There are many registers R1 to Rn, Rn minus 1. Anything can be used. Whereas in this case, it is a very specific register. It's a program counter. So A plus the content of program counter. You get the operand from A location from the current program counter value. It's basically used in the case of jumps, used in locality. So can you see this? This is your memory. You have your address A that is being specified. So the opcode clearly tells, for example, jump, jump to which location? Jump to 200. It is not like I am going to absolute location 200. Whatever is the program counter value, let us say program counter value is 1000. So now I am basically jumping into 1200. This 200 is added with this 1000 and that is the location wherein my operand is available or that is the place where I am going to jump. So it can be operand or it can be the place where the control transfer happens. So it is A plus PC. So it can be jump operations or conditional jumping or unconditional jumping wherein I specify the displacement because it is relative addressing mode it is always with respect to the current program counter value. So in this case where the program is currently where the control of the program is currently which is pointed by the program counter from there I may have to go certain locations relatively or forward or backward. So accordingly the address value can be given. Now the next dialect is base register addressing or indexed addressing. In base register addressing A holds displacement and R holds pointer to a base address. So you have a base value which is kept in register and then A will be holding your displacement. In this case R sometimes may be explicit which R register holds it. So in short basically it is R plus A. The content of R plus A is your effective address. There is no difference it is we have seen that. Now in index addressing A is acting as the base and R is displacement. Here in this case A is the displacement. When you go for indexed addressing mode R is the displacement. So effective address is A plus R that you have. So whenever you are accessing array the base can be given at A and R can be the displacement. So R you keep on increasing A of 0, A of 1. A of 2. When you access array, every time the R value is incremented and A specify the base of the array. So any kind of accessing into the arrays, this is the way in which that is being handled. So base register addressing mode and index addressing mode are typically used for locality of references, accessing adjacent locations with respect to some base. And then we come to the stack addressing mode. We have seen that in the case of a stack architecture or a stack machine, the operands are always on the top of the stack. So when you tell add, then that means pop two items from the stack and then add. I am not specifying where the operand is. So it is actually an implied addressing mode or implicit addressing mode where the value is already that is been there. Now we have the last category that is auto increment and auto decrement addressing mode. The operand is incremented or decremented based upon the execution time. So the first example, think of a case add R1, R2 plus. What I want is, I have to add the content of R1 from a memory location pointed by R2. So this is a register indirecting that is coming. Go to R2, it gives an address, go to that location. But then R2 I have to be automatically incrementing after this addition is over. So perform an add and then there is an incrementing. So these two will happen when I use this auto incrementing addressing mode. Now coming into auto decrementing addressing mode, it is a pre-decrementer. First I decrement the value of R2 and then I perform R1 assigned equal to R1 plus memory location of R2. So this is same, the adding portion is same. In the case of auto increment, I increment one of the operand value. In the case of auto decrement, I pre-decrement and then only I perform the addition. So here it is basically decrementing followed by add. So this is the next addressing mode that we have seen. So now we have seen different types of addressing modes right from an implicit addressing mode to an immediate addressing mode where the operand is directly specified in the instruction. In the case of an implicit, I will not even specify what the operand is. 
from the opcode itself it is clear like complement accumulator shifting accumulator and all and then we came to direct and indirect addressing mode where either i specify the memory locations address directly or one level of indirection go to memory and from there one more pointer two level of memory access and then we talked about register addressing mode where i'll directly specify the register name that contains your data value or your operand or register indirecting the register contains the address of the location so and then we have seen the displacement mode the index addressing mode the relative addressing mode wherein one is added with another it can be program counter it can be a base register it can be an address that is already been there there are some minor variations here and there wherein the effective address is obtained by adding two quantities and then we have the stack addressing mode that we learnt and then finally the auto increment and auto decrementing addressing modes so i can have multiple options that is been available so the instruction set architecture and the addressing mode will give a plenty of choices to the programmer or the compiler what category of instruction or what should be the exact instruction that you generate so these are all the available possibilities in what way you wanted to specify your data either directly in the instruction or you put the data inside memory and specify the address of the location if you want one more level of indirection maybe more you know security or privacy required you put an indirection you put in somewhere his address is copied keep it in location of a memory or a register or you wanted to specify a starting point and then you put the displacement so depending upon the wide range of requirements that is needed in order to translate a high level language code we require plenty of options in the way in which an instruction can be specified so addressing modes gives plenty of such choices so we are coming to the end of this lecture a quick summary of what we learned we started with what is instruction the difference between instruction set architecture and the micro architecture where is instruction set architecture fitting into the four classification of instruction set architecture right from stack machine accumulator machine register memory architectures and register register or load store architectures then we have learned about different types of addressing modes we have seen with examples with illustrations so with this we got a fair idea of what an instruction is what are the various way in which i can make use of instruction set architecture to get my task done and how addressing modes helps so with this we come to the end of this lecture i hope you got an understanding about instruction set architecture and how we gel up with addressing modes happy learning thank you Thank mm -hmm. you.